Our next speaker is uh, Mike Wallace, um, who's going to be talking about time variations in tropical rainfall, three perspectives. It looks like sugar on the slides. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. Well, my, uh, my talk is just an, an introduction to a, a story of the first time I met Shukla. Uh, so, uh, but I put his, uh, his picture at the beginning here to um, um, emphasize that I guess my choice of title is that uh, was determined by the fact that rainfall over, uh, convective rainfall over the tropical continents in particular is uh, one of Shukla's favorite subjects and particularly with a view towards uh, prediction. And uh, not only on the long time scale as we've heard about mostly today, but even to be able to make decent predictions on the time scale of a few days. And uh, so I thought that it would be interesting to uh, just uh, talk about that topic. Um, so I'm going to present uh, two, uh, there's uh, three different perspectives on it. Uh, the first is uh, just the sort of traditional perspective where we think like a synoptic meteorologist about the evolving distribution of rainfall, which is uh, uh, quite complicated. The second is uh, the, the one that uh, very close to the spirit of Brian Hoskins' talk earlier this morning. Uh, we think of the, the contribution of waves and organized planetary scale variability to that, to that rainfall. In a way, that takes us up in scale, uh, trying to see the big planetary scale picture. And then uh, the other way, uh, the third one, is uh, coming down in scale and looking very locally in space and time and thinking about how uh, the evolution of the synoptic system from day to day is going to affect how weather plays out at a, at a particular point. And in many parts of the land areas of the tropics, uh, the diurnal cycle is a very important part of that rain. And so we uh, should be thinking about how that diurnal cycle is perturbed. So uh, just, a, just a picture of the conventional view uh, that I just took from the web uh, earlier this week. And uh, we see uh, India here with, um, in the water vapor imagery, uh, uh, a couple of big systems over it, which are, uh, I'm sure by today have changed substantially. Um, I'm going to come back to this way of thinking about it right at the very end, but I'm going to uh, go on now and talk about waves. My own uh, personal experience uh, stimulated very much by uh, some of the uh, um, seminars I went to with, uh, uh, where Ver Vern, Werner Sumi showed the first space-based pictures of satellites and uh, being able to see, even from those still shots, uh, an evolution from day to day with uh, areas of convective rainfall moving systematically, that led to uh, a series of papers, and this was the first one in the literature with C.P. Chang, uh, who was a, a then a graduate student in our department, and uh, essentially making these pictures by, uh, by ma uh, making printouts of what was then just visible imagery, uh, slicing them up so that you had like the zero to five degree latitude band, the five to 10, and then sorting them by latitude and then pasting them onto cardboard. And amazingly seeing what you could see from Vern Sumi's uh, uh, presentations, but just putting it in a form where you could see it all in one picture, these waves uh, propagating westward. This particular section is from 5 to 10 degrees north, and so we're seeing uh, uh, westward, uh, and time, I should say, goes down in, in uh, this particular section. So we're seeing waves that are propagating westward and uh, the early synoptic meteorologists referred to these as, as uh, easterly waves. And it 
this time in these early years, this is what uh, we thought of as the dominant form of evolution in the tropics. Just a year after this was the first of the Madden and Julian papers and with uh, eastward propagation. And um, so the later sections uh, of, of this kind that were made were showing those as well. I particularly like this one by uh, Tetsuo Nakazawa, published back in the late 80s, uh, in which we can see uh, the same kind of easterly waves that I showed in the previous image, but now the, these easterly waves arranged in uh, kind of envelopes that are, are going the other way, going, going eastward, just a blow up here. Uh, and this is uh, the signature of the MJO, which was well recognized by the time of uh, Nakazawa's paper. And then uh, a few more recent images, uh, publication by uh, Catherine Straub, uh, George Kalatis was a co-author of this too, uh, showing just a broader scope, a longer period of time where you see the the MJO, or some of these uh, are interpreted also as just pure uh, Kelvin waves, uh, sort of non-dispersive uh, looking, and uh, you get the impression looking at these of very long lines of organized convection. And this major one uh, goes almost all the way around, around the world. So, uh, and then uh, in this one, you also see the easterly waves as well. You can see those small slices of things going westward. So you could uh, imagine this uh, almost as a, as a forecast scheme. And then Brian Hoskins took it a step further this morning, showing how you can uh, get the, the kind of analysis he described would, would enable you to have some meridional structure as well as, uh, as zonal structure. And uh, just, a remind, just a last slide here, just indicating that this is not quite as simple as it looks, because when you take uh, slices, uh, time slices out of the diagram and actually look at what the uh, uh, rainfall or cloud pattern looks like at these times, um, and, and go back to a full two dimensions, then it's not, it's not so simple. It's not just a blob going eastward. The blob is, is um, assuming a variety of forms and sometimes with real structure to it as we see in this uh, upper right one. So now I'd uh, like to um, go to the other extreme and uh, look at perturbations in the diurnal cycle. And to do that, I'm going to use, as a surrogate for precipitation, I'm going to use lightning uh, as sensed from a global network uh, which um, is, uh, has about almost 100 ground stations which are uh, measuring the arrival time of spherics, waves in the ionosphere that are generated by lightning flashes. And uh, this provides a data set on lightning flashes. Uh, every, uh, it gets just the strong ones. And for, for every flash, you get the exact uh, latitude, latitude, longitude to within five kilometers or so and the precise time. And so with, the, with that database, it's very easy to construct all kinds of climatologies. This is just the, uh, the annual mean frequency of flashes uh, in Southeast Asia here, where you see uh, the monsoon area lights up very well, but you, uh, you see the land and the areas near land, the coastal waters, the offshore waters near land, uh, have the greatest frequency of, uh, of the lightning flashes. Whoops. So now I'm, I'm going to just show you a series of animations uh, of the diurnal cycle. We're just going to take a little tour for a couple of minutes. And uh, we can see the uh, remarkable amount of structure in this. 
Perhaps a good one to start with is the, the lower one, which is showing the coast of Australia, and the convection popping up in the early afternoon right along the shore, and then expanding inland in the afternoon, and then, and then shrinking back. And uh, also, you notice uh, some features here in, like, in the offshore waters in the, uh, was it the Gulf of Carpentaria, Peter, in the north. Uh, then, much more complicated uh, picture over the marine continent, um, but the, the same elements in it. And here, um, interesting, the, the, the more interesting role of the offshore waters, uh, particularly if you look at the, uh, that's the Strait of Molucca between Sumatra, there, the westernmost island, and uh, the, the end of the Malay Peninsula. Singapore is right at the end there. Uh, you see how uh, there's a lot of lightning in the strait, and that's nighttime lightning. It looks like the afternoon lightning from the, uh, the thunderstorms generated over land are generating waves that are radiating out in both directions and um, causing this sharp maximum at, in nighttime. And you can see nighttime maxima uh, to the west of Sumatra all along the whole strip of it and what looks like a gravity wave uh, propagating out there. So you can imagine if you were living in one of these places, um, most of the time uh, the, the biggest variation in rainfall is between different times of day. Uh, if uh, you're, say, on the coast of uh, one of these islands, you expect the, the rain comes in the early afternoon and, and then it's... Uh, you see the, the uh, convective clouds offshore during the night and morning hours. So we can think of uh, how, whether there's forecast potential in an area like this to be able to say how this diurnal cycle is going to, to be different from one day to the next. Um, and I'll get into that in just a minute. I just wanted to show you a couple of other examples. In uh, India, you can see these are, I should say, these are all annual mean movies. Data from all seasons are included in these. You get sharper movies when you specialize it to seasons. India, uh, though I won't show you the slides, India is particularly interesting. You get much more of this, of this diurnal variability with a lot of lightning during the pre-monsoon and the post-monsoon season. The monsoon is, is uh, not is, monsoon season itself is not so interesting. The rainfall is, tends to be more steady through the day and uh, much less lightning with it. So most of this structure is coming from the pre-monsoon and post-monsoon. Indochina has very interesting variability and uh, the Philippines and looking at the afternoon, uh, the evening convection flowing off there into the west, uh, into the uh, South China Sea. A little closer to home here, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, late morning into the afternoon hours going on to land. And very interesting uh, area is off the coast of uh, the southeastern uh, United States. Uh, notice you see Florida there, and uh, Florida blows up with lightning in the uh, afternoon, and then uh, the Gulf Stream lights up during the night. And uh, you can see that is related to the land sea breeze uh, circulation. And uh, that's a year-round uh, phenomenon, but mostly, mostly summer. Uh, Central America is a very interesting area to look at, and the, particularly the offshore waters off Panama, which have a lot of uh, convection. And um, there are parts of uh, the inland valleys of Bolivia, which are kind of the lightning capitals of the world. They have some of the, the highest lightning rates, and it's all nocturnal because it's, uh, they're in depressions between mountain ranges. Here's Borneo, uh, depicted in a little more detail. Just amazing structure in this. And you can, I should say that you can see this 
very clearly in the trim rainfall as well. I, I won't take the time to show a slide of that, but the lightning just shows the diurnal variability just more sharply, and you can, it's, the uh, spatial resolution is better. So now just a little bit, a few ideas about how synoptic very, uh, scale variability might play into the diurnal cycle. Um, this is, uh, these are slides from uh, work of Katrina Wirtz, one of our, uh, uh, one of my former graduate students who's now a postdoc with Bob Howes. So uh, in the upper panel, um, well, it, it, these, these panels are both constructed in, in the same way. Uh, day, uh, first, the data are 15-day high-pass filtered because we wanted to get rid of the MJO and we wanted to get rid of every seasonal variability, the QBO. We uh, wanted to just get rid of that all and just look at the relatively unstructured day-to-day -day variability. And this would be the variability that a weather forecaster would be interested in if you're trying to forecast uh, how tomorrow is going to be different from today. So then based on that high-pass filtered data, uh, the uh, lightning frequency, uh, and this is integrated over the whole day, is regressed on scalar wind speed at 850 millibars, uh, point by point. So it's it's um, so the map is just constructed by putting all these uh, regressions together. So you see the blue over land means that when it's uh, more windy, but uh, when the wind at 850 millibar wind is stronger, uh, there's not as much lightning uh, over land. Uh, but there is, there does tend to be a little more over the over the water, and uh, uh, in, in most areas, it's five minutes, right. Uh, the, you can see the same signature in the trim, trim rainfall at the bottom. Uh, here is uh, uh, another, another thing she looked at was wind direction. And uh, each of these, these uh, islands in Indonesia have a prominent mountain range and that's indicated by the straight lines in the upper figure. And she made a day-by-day -day index of the wind with the component perpendicular to those lines. So it's the, it's the component that will induce upslope and downslope perturbations. So then in the lower panels, we see the both precipitation and then in the bottom panel lightning and the regressions on this index. And uh, in all cases you see a dipole and you might say, oh, we see more uh, upstream rainfall uh, and lightning um, uh, relative to these uh, changes in wind. But in fact, it's just the other way around. So you get more lightning and rainfall downstream it seemed, um, and that's, that's a consistent result. We've discussed that with Bob Howes, and apparently it's well known in the lightning community that in, or in the uh, tropical convection community, the people who look at radar data, that, that the downslope uh, areas are particularly vulnerable to the thunderstorms. So there, uh, this is just to show uh, that there is some structure here. I want to just uh, conclude by uh, coming back to these three perspectives. And uh, the first time I met Shukla was at, at an AMS meeting, and it was kind of a, a war of the worlds between the first two perspectives. Um, at that time, uh, Colin Ramage and James Sadler at the University of Hawaii organized a, it was like a town hall uh, evening session to have kind of a face-off between the people who believed in waves and the people who were real synoptic meteorologists and, in and, and Ramage's words, who resented these incursions of mid-latitude people like Charney who were telling them that this was all just waves that they were seeing. And uh, 
Dick, my colleague, Dick Reed, was kind of dreading this section because he was a wave person and he was afraid that he was going to get attacked. Well, this new graduate student named uh, Jay Shukla came into the meeting and I don't know whether he was asked to take charge of it or whether he just did, but, <laughs> but it ended up being a very constructive discussion and in fact, no one was put down in this meeting. Uh, realized, uh, uh, it came through very clearly that, of course, we have to be thinking about the synoptic picture, but the waves helps us to interpret uh, what we're, we're seeing. And uh, I just remember how nicely he did that. I think even Colin Ramage went away happy. <laughs> so, so that's uh, the end. say something about uh, Shukla's remarkable dip diplomatic skill that he can make Colin Ramage happy. So, <laughs> um, I, I think one of the interesting things about the diurnal cycle is its um, impact on, on uh, uh, large-scale uh, features like the Madden-Julian oscillation. And uh, the, the models tend to fail and lose predictability compared to observations, if you'd like, uh, over the maritime continent. And I sort of wonder how well the models, even the high-resolution ECWF models, how well they do with the diurnal cycle and uh, what the impact might be on, on, on longer-term predictability. Well, currently, Shidong uh, Zhang has sold the idea that this is one of the big areas of uncertainty, and there is a program that's being planned for two years from now, like that, for over the marine continent to study just this kind of phenomenon. Uh, actually, my comment was going to ask you to show me one of the slides, but it's already gone. So let me just remind you have a slide with three titles, right? Synoptic plus right. propagating plus diurnal cycle. Right. Uh, what if you put a fourth item on that, that the modulation of annual cycle? Because yes. most of the work that we have seen is basically most of the droughts and floods and all the influences of alenium, all the predictability that comes, just can be captured. Do you agree with that? By I one do. small modification, the yes. modulation of no. annual cycle. I, I totally agree. And, and uh, I think that's a fascinating way to look at it as well. Yeah, just a, a comment on the diurnal cycle, having sort of been one of my favorite topics for many years. And it, it's something that finally, when you get down to modeling at the kilometer scale, around the maritime continent, you can finally get these propagating gravity waves that Peter saw running down the Bay of Bengal and that were clearly coming off these. So we can do it. And then I think the question is, what can we learn from that about how we parameterize that, if we can? Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is that you can, you can get there. And uh, uh, that's really exciting because I think it right. opens up all sorts of opportunities to assess them um, what is the yeah. bulk hydrological cycle if you like of a region like the maritime continent which we know that the models just still get massively yeah. wrong you might just so learn it's really something exciting to you see might just that. learn something fundamental about convection absolutely uh, absolutely